Welcome to John Gets Games. Today, I'm excited to talk about my initial impressions on 24 different games that I played at Board Game GeekCon last weekend. Now, that is way too many for one video, so I've split it up into eight games in three videos, and I've kind of scattered the ones I liked and the ones I disliked throughout all three videos. So, let's jump right into it. The first game, just gonna get it out of the way, was Mysterium by Portal Games. This was probably the hit of the convention. It, it sold out relatively early before I was able to get a copy, unfortunately, and it is phenomenal. It's a cooperative game, which I'm not normally crazy into, but there is no way that anybody can take over this game and tell other people what to do because, okay, so one player plays a ghost and every other player plays a psychic who is in a haunted house. And the psychics are all connected with one person who died in that house. And the ghost is trying to lead the psychics to figuring out who they're connected with so they can solve this uh, age, this long ago murder. And the way that works is all the players get dreams in the middle of the night, which are these cards that the ghost player gives out. They are really surrealistic. If you've ever played Dixit, they're a lot like that, where there's all sorts of unconnected, beautiful stuff going on in each card, and they're going to give a couple of them to each player. And the player needs to figure out the connections between these really weird cards and the reality of the situation they're trying to figure out. So first they need to figure out who is the person I'm connected with, and they could look down on a card and see oh, there's a picture of a race car driver and a medal, and, and it's a guy with a mustache. Okay, that's probably a race car driver, and here's a guy, there's um, barber shears and a little top hat. Okay, maybe that guy was um, a hair cutter. And then you get these cards in, and you think, oh my goodness, what does these two cards have in connection with more, uh, with one than any of the others that are out in front of you? And you're all talking about it. So it's this awesome group deduction thing while the ghost is sitting on the other side of the table, can't say anything because you know the dreams are done and now everyone has woken up in the morning and they're interpreting and it's really, really cool. I enjoyed it a lot. I'm definitely gonna be grabbing it because I love deduction and I hate, the only reason I don't like cooperative games is because somebody takes over and there's no way to do it because the answer is not set in stone and there's all sorts of awesome moments when you get it right and, and really perplexing moments when you think, I can't believe I got that wrong, it was so obvious. You sure it wasn't that location ghost? And the ghost says, no, I guess I gave him the wrong cards. And of course, the ghost has a very set number of cards. They don't have every option ever. So they might just give you a card because the predominant color on that card is blue and the location is kind of blue-ish. So there's just so many different ways to take it. Really, really cool game. Game two was actually a prototype. And this is something I did not expect to be able to play at the convention. And that was Seafall by Rob Davio, which is his Euro legacy game. Uh, if you're not familiar with legacy games, the idea of those is that the game permanently changes as the game goes on. Like you play one game and then the next time you play the board has changed because you're putting stickers down and uh, you might be tearing things up. You're doing all sorts of very permanent things to create a unique gaming experience. And this one is kind of a 4 x Euro game. I'm not going to commit to the 4X bit and I'm not even going to say too much about the game, but it was really good. And we got to try a version of the game that had some new mechanics. Like it was very, a very new, uh, some new changes that Rob Davio had put in there and some of them work really well, some of them need a little bit of fine tuning, but it's got ships, you're putting stickers down, I enjoyed it, and I cannot wait until the real version of it comes out. Game three is The Witcher, and this is a game that my friend Matt and I demoed at the Fantasy Flight Games booth, and we were intrigued enough that we went out of our way and rented it from the game library and played a short two quest full version of the game with three players, and, and I enjoyed it. It did some pretty interesting things that I'm not used to in adventure games, where like right from the very beginning of the game on your first turn you can spend an action and start developing. You can get a new skill just for, just for spending the action or you might get a new axe or various upgrading type things that sometimes it, you have to kill a bunch of monsters first to get experience and do this. Not in this game, you just get it right away. Uh, you're gonna be moving around this board, uh, going from city to city, getting clues and once you get enough clues you turn those in for, I don't know, a, a realization token or something like that and you spend those to complete quests, to get victory points, and at the end of the game you want to have the most victory points. It's relatively multiplayer solitaire, there's a little bit of things you can do where you could help somebody else with their quest, whether they want it or not, and you get more points than they do. For the most part, you're running around the board doing your own thing. And turns are very very quick, you only have two actions, which is kind of good because it means that it's going to be your turn again relatively soon. But on the flip side, it means you oftentimes don't feel like you did anything on your turn. You just move to a location and then maybe rest and then your turn's over. But it'll come back again to you relatively quickly, so that's not a problem. You're going to be fighting a lot of monsters. Oftentimes it feels like you don't really get much for those monsters, especially the low-level ones. But you get victory points for the higher ones. In general, I enjoyed playing it. I hope to play it again at some point, but I'm not necessarily going to rush out and try and buy it. Game 4 is Johari. 
Now, this is a game I was not initially interested in. I heard lukewarm opinions of it that it might be kind of boring and dry, but then I saw an interesting video of it online. I decided to give it a shot. We played a three-player game, and we ended up enjoying it. The basic idea of this game is you have a hand of um, some number of cards, action cards like seven or so, and everyone simultaneously picks one and puts it down. It has a cost associated with it. You all flip it over and you evaluate it in turn order in kind of a Stefan Feld style where you have um, turn order pieces and the ones on top go in order. And you pay the cost for the card and you do the thing, which is usually purchasing gems from various different spots on a board. Uh, then you all pick from your ex um, the cards you have left to do the second spot. You flip that over and we do that again in this specific player order, which has probably changed because that's based on the amount of gold you have. In the second slot, it's a, there's a discount to playing the card, and then we'll all do that a third time, and in this slot, every card is free. But at this point, all the good stuff has been taken. Now, the interesting parts of this game are, first of all, you're trying to get sets. It's a set collection game. You're buying these gems from markets. You're trying to turn that either a lot of them in, uh, a wide variety of them in, or just one of them in. If you do just one, you want a lot of it, but you can't turn it in for points unless somebody else has some of them, some of that gem as well, you need to have more of them, which sounds kind of convoluted and weird, but in reality, it means you're really paying attention to what your other players are doing. If you have eight uh, rubies and neither of them have any, you can't turn those in for points. And they're not gonna wanna take rubies because they, they see you have eight rubies. Everything is open face in this game. So they're not gonna take them. So you, have, you definitely have interesting decisions to make based on what other people do. This is not a multiplayer solitaire game at all. Uh, and then when you do diversity, you're going to get less points, but it's not associated with what other players have. Also, many of the gems are counterfeit. And whenever somebody sells gems, either a variety or a singularity, everyone else has to discard one of their counterfeit gems because the inspector goes around when there's a sale. So there are ways to protect yourself around this, but you definitely are interacting with what other people have. If you have lots of counterfeit gems, it's going to affect how you play versus what you think your opponents are going to do so that you can protect them. I found it really enjoyable. There's a little bit of engine building. You get these cards that can buff the cards in your hand, so you always have the same cards in your hand. You, you pull the three back up and you do it all over again, but you might get a card that says, okay, every, now you, every time you do this one card, it costs you less, or it's a little bit more powerful. Very solid game. Uh, we felt it was a bit long. It was a 12-turn game, and it kind of felt like maybe this game should have been like eight or nine turns. I think I might end up getting this, and if I do, I doubt I will ever play it to 12 turns again. And the game went well over an hour and a half, and I felt like it wanted to be about an hour, hour 15. So I'll tweak around with that. That's really easy to change because you just have a deck of 12 cards, and once you go through all 12, it's done. So you could just put less cards in that deck, and I think the game will work very well in that way. So I liked it. Game 5 is a word game called Prolix. I didn't expect to play any word games at this convention because it's not a kind of game that I like in general as a genre, mostly because my brain just locks down with trying to figure out what word I can make with these letters, because usually you only have those letters to work with in many word games. Also, there's usually a timing element of like a sand timer or just your friends getting really frustrated at you for taking too long of a turn. And this game kind of fixes a lot of those things. Uh, the way it works is you have a board with eight different uh, letters on it, and you just can say any word you want. You are only going to get scored for the letters that match up with the ones on the board, so you want to have a word that uses as many of them as you can, but at the end of the day, you're not overly restricted. You feel relatively free to just go with something, and if you're not coming up with anything good, you just say something that's not that great, get a couple of points, and be a little bummed about your turn, but not worry about it too much. Now, there is a little bit of a timing element in that your opponents can jump in on your turn and say a word instead of you. They can interrupt, but they get a negative point uh, penalty for doing that, and they also get to, they have to cross out one of the previous words. So, if they had a crappy word, then they're probably going to want to interrupt you, but it seems relatively balanced to the point where they're not just going to be saying any word. They're only going to interrupt you if they really come up with something better than you. So there is a bit of a timing stress there, but the game is so light and that you, you have that feeling that you could jump in on somebody else's if they jump in on you and squander your turn that it seems to bounce out really well. I was very pleasantly surprised by this. I could see myself owning it and I look forward to playing it again. Game six is Istanbul. Uh, now this game got a lot of hype because it won the Kennerspiel des Jahres this year and I, I read about it, I looked into it, and I didn't really think it was necessarily going to be my thing, but when I had the opportunity to play it at the convention, I decided to jump in and just give it a shot and see what all the buzz was about. And ultimately, I liked it about as much as I thought it was going to, which is, I didn't hate the time I spent playing it, but it really didn't engage me very much. And there's a few reasons for that. Largely, you, it has this mechanism where you have a stack of 
of workers essentially and you just move to an adjacent spot on the board and you lay a worker down and then you do the action and then at some point you run out of workers because your stack gets smaller and smaller at which point you have to either start re retracing your steps or you just start losing turns until you can go back and start retracing your steps. Your steps. Unfortunately, that means that I felt like the whole game I was doing everything twice because I would do a path and then I would undo that path and I felt very restricted by that. I know there are probably other ways you can go and I'm sure I was playing poorly, but I didn't I didn't like feeling like I was just going back and forward doing the same actions. You know, I feel I felt vested that once I did these three or four actions, I was going to have to go back and do them again before I could do something else. And you could break off to do other things, but now you're stranding pawns, which you could say, okay, those are interesting decisions, but it didn't really line up for me. Also, at the end of the day, this is a Euro game, but it's a race. It's the first person to get to uh, some number of rubies. So it also had that realization where like three turns from the end, I said, I, it'll take me five turns exactly to win, to, to, to end. And I look over to the person next to me because there's pretty much no hidden information. And I say, it's going to take him two turns to win. So I just going to kind of phone in my last couple turns because it's not even, it's not even a choice. It's not even close. And uh, I don't really like that in games. So I don't see myself playing Istanbul again, but I'm glad I did. Game seven is lifted. And this was a huge surprise to me. I had seen a little bit about it on uh, the Board Game Geek stream from Essen, but a friend of mine ran over with a copy of it in his hands and says, we gotta play this, we gotta play this, we gotta play this. And I said, okay. And it's, it's a really goofy game, more, almost more of an experience. It's a dexterity game where you strap this little crane to your head. And from that, there's a string that drops down to a hook. And you are manipulating this with your head and you're trying to build these, um, these structures with these essentially kitty type toys and very like there's an angle and there's a sphere and there's a cylinder and they got little hooky spots in it. You can pick them up and you're trying to build these towers uh, based off of a card that's played down. Now we didn't actually play the official rules with the time frame on them. We just played two, uh, two teams, uh, myself and my friend Hung versus my friend Matt and Dylan. And we just flipped over the card. Whoever built it first won, and we didn't really keep track. And it was so much fun. <laughs> oh my gosh, we had a blast. And people started crowding around the table looking at us and you know, laughing along with us. Uh, my friend Hung and I, at one point, we had to get an angular piece in a really hard way, so we both hooked our hooks into it. So we're both controlling the same piece with our heads, and we accidentally knock over the whole tower. And it's, it's so silly, and it was so much fun. I have got to get this. <laughs> when, when it becomes available, I'm going to acquire it because this is such an amazing icebreaker. I mean, as a filler, it's brilliant. It's just, it's just a really fun kind of party game-ish experience that was a total blast. Uh, I mean, just look up any photos or videos online and I think you're probably going to want to play it too. And for the final game of this video, number eight, we have Hyperborea. If you've seen my John Gets Excited videos, you might know that I was really excited to play this game. I, it was one of my number one games to play at the convention because it looked gorgeous. It had some, you're, you're getting technology. You're, you have this bag of cubes in it and you, you can decide which new cubes to put in there and you're pulling them out. You have a bag building thing going on and you're putting them around. Oh man, I was really, really excited to play this. I played it on my second day of the convention with my friend Matt and two other people and it totally flopped. <laughs> For all of us, we were all just sitting there thinking, why is this so hyped? I don't get it. <laughs> and I'm sitting there, I'm like, I was so excited about this game. Why am I not enjoying it? And there were a couple reasons for that. The first is that it was slow, uh, most, mostly because you every time you reset the bag, every time you go through your entire bag, that's when you get to kind of pull your pieces out of the cities on the map, and then you get to use all the pieces on the map again. But once they're used, you don't get to use them again until you go through that bag, which incentivizes you to keep your bag small, which is weird in a game that's all about building that bag up. So of course, and I decided, I immediately started getting cubes into the bag of specific colors, the ones that would match my technologies for my race. And the one guy who didn't, who just said, I think I'm just not gonna add cubes into my bag at all, pretty much. He, he added maybe like four in the entire game, and he had this amazing ability to pull three out for one blue. He just did that every turn. For the first three turns of the game, he just played every single cube from his bag, um, because he had a spot to go on the board to pull another one out, and then he would spend a blue to pull three more out, and then the way the math worked out, he did this like three turns in a row. And then 
uh, later on, he got a couple cubes to the point where he was resetting every two turns, and it felt like what he was doing was the way the game was supposed to be played, and all of us were sitting there like schmucks. We're like, why do we keep putting cubes in our bag? It's slowing down the amount of time we have until the, we can reset the board. On average, it took us three to four um, turns to be able to unset our dudes, and that felt so slow and just clunky and awkward. I would love to be told that I was playing this game incorrectly. I don't necessarily think we were, but it just really really disappointed all of us. We felt very uh, disassociated with any theme. It just did not work. And I don't know. I mean, if somebody is really excited and they want me to play it with them at some point in the future, I'll give it a go again, maybe to see if we maybe got a little rule wrong here or there. But I don't really see that happening, which is definitely a bummer. But I'm glad I did that before I spent a bunch of money on it. And that wraps up this first video. If you want to click the link over there or the one down in the description, you will go to the next eight games that I'm going to talk about that I played at this convention. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. Please subscribe if you like what you've seen, and thanks for watching.